Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Angelo Di Paola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty. The first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. All right, guys, I am your host, Butch Theory, here again this week. And before we jump into the report, we got a really cool opportunity for you. We have partnered with AFCO, and they are offering all of our listeners a free sun protection mask with any purchase of AFCO products. They make a ton of great products for all types of anglers. All you have to do to get the coupon code is text the word FISHING to 314-665-1767. Again, just text the word FISHING to 314-665-1767 to subscribe to our email list, and we'll send you the promo code via email. All right, guys, we have a great Alabama saltwater fishing report lined up for you this week. But first, let's take a few minutes to check out a few of this week's great sponsors. This week's Alabama saltwater fishing report is brought to you by Sportsman's Marine. Sportsman's Marine has an extensive tackle selection of anything that local anglers need for saltwater and freshwater fishing, as well as boating accessories. They have the largest selection of the slick lure in Mobile and Baldwin County. They have AFCO, Pelagic, and Saltwater Fanatics apparel along with other local brands. Go check out their Edgewater, Wellcraft, and Vexus lines of boats. They offer engine services with five star yamaha and mercury mechanics also if you're looking for a street legal electric golf cart go check out their atric golf carts sportsman's marine on highway 98 and they also have a downtown location next to mr gene's beans in fairhope alabama and also brought to you by killer dock as anglers we put a lot of time money and passion into fishing but most of us do not have a fish cleaning station that we are proud of many of us are suffering from dock dysfunction a rotten table with rusty metal this is just no good but the dock enhancement that we've all been waiting for is finally here Killer Dock uses marine-grade aluminum to make fabulous fish cleaning tables and stunning canopies that will keep us out of the sun. Killer Dock combines durability, function, and design to uniquely upgrade your entire dock experience. Visit KillerDock.com to see more. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report. I am your host, Butch Theory. I am joined today with Angelo Di Paola, the Coastal Connection, as my co-host. What'd you say, Cap? Man, just soaking up some of the sunny weather, no rain for a couple of days. I mean, finally, I'm just kind of digging life. No been doubt. Been fishing man. a ton. Been fishing a ton. I saw that uh, nice dolphin you guys got this weekend. What, 40? Ended up taking it? 40. Well, we caught that Memorial Day, but it was like the sport fishing championship is, I don't know, it's like what, 12 to 16 tournaments over the course of the summer. So, uh, we caught that one early on and got lucky and it, it, it held out. There was a close call in Puerto Rico with uh, Team Bandino, like literally my neighbors, <laughs> like almost beat me out on it. So every once in a while, a blind hog finds an egg corn. That's awesome, man. Congratulations. I don't know if we talked about that one on here. I don't recall. Do you remember if we did? I don't know. But I mean, like that weekend, this is what I remember. Like we're on a smaller boat. We don't have tuna tubes. We don't have a ton of range. And like, we're like just bet dolphin and Wahoo. And, you know, we pulled up, pulled a big spread of like kind of those sorts of lures or Ballyhoo Islander combos. And that one, I will tell you, and like, this isn't like a normal lure you would pull out of a rigger, but when pulled out the rigger, the black bark sand sal candy, the smaller one is just like pull it out your long center or either either one of your long rigger positions that was like in a long left for us. I mean, that thing catches blue marlin, dolphin, tuna, wahoo, how we hooked about a 600 pound mako on it one day. I mean, wow. it's just a great all around lure. And that's what that fish ate. I mean, I remember like watching, we're on one of those weed lines, you know, they don't have any, doesn't have any current, but there's big patches of grass. Oh yeah. And we were just back and forth on this, like probably mile, mile and a half stretch of this piece of grass. I mean, hours. And then all of a sudden this big, we see a big wake, just how old you see a big bull coming mm -hmm. out at you. And we, I kind of felt like right then, you know, that's probably was a dolphin, but it never jumped <laughs> and uh, it pulled 25 and 30 pound dolphin on even 50 pound tackle don't beat those right. fish pretty good but you know ended up being a 40 pounder and uh heck, held on through the summer through some uh pretty good uh fishing locales yeah so, definitely man that's fun that's an awesome. extra 50k heck yeah that's nice for sure that helps with the fuel bill no no that, that was fun to at least another two three butts of fishing that's right yeah at least <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that's cool, man. That's great. Congratulations. Uh, I'm going to talk to Captain King this week. They got to get offshore a couple of times. Be curious to see what he's been seeing out there south, south of Dolphin Island and Orange Beach. Speaking of Orange Beach, Gulf Shores, what's going on over there at the real estate market? You guys seen anything different than the last time we had you on? Man, very minimal change. And I'll just, I'm, I'm going to be real quick because this is kind of what we're seeing. So, like, if you watch the news and, and you kind of like, there's just, the news media is out there to sell some fear. Yeah. And like, they're correct in that real estate transactions. I mean, first off, real estate is local, wherever you're at. It's different here than it is in Los Angeles, California, or Miami, or pick some little bitty town in Alabama. Everywhere is different. But what we're really seeing is is a pretty solid decline in transactions. With that being said, we're also seeing a decline in buyers and a decline in sellers. So transaction count is down, which is not good for real estate agents or lenders because we're not making as much money, which means you need to be extra careful about who you deal with because you're going to be dealing with some people that are being that are going to be in desperation and they're going to want to tell you what you want to hear to get listings. We're starting to see that. We're seeing a lot of overpriced properties. We're not seeing anything really great on the market, in my opinion. But when you take number of listings coming on the market versus number of listings going under contract, I mean, we're staying at about the same inventory levels that we saw for the past two years, hmm. which means like for the consumer, there's not a lot of choices and there's not a lot of disruption in prices just yet. Do I think winter is coming and like it could get a little rockier? It could. The data doesn't play that out yet, though. And I don't see that either. I mean, anything that comes on the market that's within striking distance of where it should be priced at, it still goes into bidding wars. And we're we're seeing that ourselves. So if you're going to sell something, you need to make sure it's priced properly. If you're going to buy something, I would tell you, be patient. Find what you're really looking for. It could take a long time. Don't be in a rush. And if you got to buy or sell because you're moving, reach out to me. We'll give you fair, fair advice of what we think it's worth. And uh, you can tell that we spend that the right amount of money to market it out and get it out in front of people. Yeah. Sounds like you need to do your research and make sure you have a real estate agent that's here to stay and not just looking for a quick flash in the pan, a couple bucks. Hey, look, when, when the market blew up, there weren't enough real estate agents in the market to handle the influx of buyers. Like now we're in contraction and we have too many real estate agents. So some of those are going to have to get out of the business. That's just simple economics. I'd make sure that I was with somebody that uh, has been in the business for a while and that also handles a large volume of transactions because they're going to have a much better feel for what's actually happening versus Aunt Susie's daughter who got a real estate license last right, October because right. it looked good. Don't use that person right now. You're not. You're going to be really, I think, selling yourself short in in a, in a market like this. It, that that person worked fine when it was hot, and but it, when things get tighter and tougher, you need a professional. I mean, gotta go with that professional between, negotiator that knows the market as a whole. Yep, that gives you good advice. Makes sense, man. You want somebody that can negotiate and. If you're looking for somebody that can negotiate, you got one on the air with you right now. That's I hate right. to be braggy, but that's what I do Amen. every day, people. Yep, it's not braggy if you're good at it, and you know it, in my opinion. <laughs> we appreciate that, man. That's great advice. You guys definitely look up the Coastal Connection if you need anything in the real estate agent. All right, Angelo, let's head down and get our first report of the day. We have a new contributor. We have Brad Warren, a.k.a. Bearded Brad. I've been seeing him all over Facebook. He's been doing an awesome job with some fishing stuff and uh, tons of techniques and tips there. I think you primarily do stuff from the shore, huh, Brad? Welcome to the show, buddy. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. Um, yeah, I do primarily um, land-based fishing, so mostly here on the Alabama coast. Very cool. Well, just tell us a little bit about uh, Brad Warren and uh, where people can find you on the social media and YouTube and kind of, kind of tell us a little bit about your journey, how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you can find me on any of the platforms, Bearded Brad, uh, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, all that stuff, um, Bearded Brad. But my wife and I moved down to, to Gulf Shores, Alabama, about four years ago from uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And we got down here and just fell in love with saltwater fishing and met some other of the local YouTubers that 
probably a lot of the people know Bama Beach Bum and a few of the other guys and started fishing with them and decided to start a YouTube channel. And it's been it's been a little over three years that I've been doing YouTube now. And it's done pretty well. I've been able to grow it and, and now doing it full time. Um, I've, I've done a little bit of surf guiding, but I'm actually just full time content creator now. Uh, it's not running any more guided trips, but kind of pumped the content out. I love uh, your uh, logo. I'm not sure if you can get that in sticker form. <laughs> it's like a big bearded yeah. guy with some sunglasses. I just think it looks good, cool. Yeah. Heck, it's a, yeah, it's a great it. It's a great beard. It's a great beard for sure. I know when I was trying to think of the name, like of course anytime you have like your own idea, you always like second guess it. And I'm like, bearded Brad just sounds so cheesy. <laughs> and then I finally like went with it and I have a buddy that's a graphic designer and he made the logo and now everybody loves it. I'm like, that that was perfect. <laughs> I'm yep. glad I didn't like second guess and go with something else. Yeah. But now I just call. can't shave my beard. Yeah, that's true. You kind of put yourself into that position. <laughs> That's all right. Oh, that's funny. Well, man, tell us a little bit about a fish story. What you've been up to the past week or so, and we'll just kind of throw in questions as we see fit. I mean, I'm, I'm sure as y'all know, we've had rain for like 100 days in a row up until the last few days. The fishing has been difficult to find some time to actually get out there, but it's been pretty decent when we can actually get a dry day to get out there. I fished the beach, set rig fishing in Fort Morgan last week and was able to find some big whiting. I caught multiple, probably probably 10 to 15, like keeper size whiting. And a few of them, I caught one 16 and a half inch and then a 15 and a half inch as well. So there's been some big whiting out there. Wow. Um, I haven't personally gotten on the pompano bite, but I know a few of the, um, the local guides around here and some of the other locals out fishing have been getting on some pompano mostly been early morning and it has seemed to be deep out they're having to cast out pretty far but there definitely are some pompano around right now which is so it's good to see brad what are people fishing with this time of year yeah so when i go out um i'm primarily fishing with uh, fresh dead shrimp either fish gum or fish bites always try to pair those with the shrimp and then if you can find some sand fleas i do like throwing out some sand fleas as well Always good to have that uh, natural base selection for sure. What's for it sure. like? Uh, the catfish and the others. I mean, I just think shrimp, and I'm thinking, dude, I'm gonna be wading through hardhead catfish. <laughs> yeah, you you definitely have to deal with that. Thankfully, the even though we've had a ton of rain, the water hasn't been that terribly dirty, um, so we haven't had to deal with the catfish as much. Now, if that water does start to muddy up, especially down Fort Morgan you are going to be dealing with some of that. And if you can just fight through that, usually it'll work out in your favor and you will pick up some of those better fish. But yeah, this time of year, you got the catfish in the dirty water. You got the lady fish that are going to be out there. Uh, we still got the hardtails, blue runners, all that kind of the summertime stuff that you do have to deal with. But again, there has been some of those, uh, I guess, target species have been out there, like the big whiting, the pompano. So uh, if you can get out there and fight through the, uh, the trash fish, so to speak, uh, you, you do have some good opportunities right now. Yeah, that's some hammer whiting, man. Do you uh, do you do a single drop for those, or do you anything? Do you do anything different? I do, yeah. So, like for pompano, typically we're using a double drop, like a float or a bead or something like that. But when I go specifically for whiting, I back it down to a ten pound fluorocarbon with a single drop, and I'll just do a little bead. I, I don't really notice the difference in color. Sometimes I use red or blues or pinks. Uh, but try to try to go super light, real small circle hook, maybe size four, even size six, and then just a tiny piece of tilled shrimp. And then a lot of times they're hanging out real close to the beach. So you don't even have to cast out very far at all. If you can kind of walk the beach looking for any any cuts or any deep pockets, typically that's where those whiting are going to be hanging out. So the other day when I was out there, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say the other day when I was out there, I had my white, I had one whiting rig and two pompano rigs. My whiting rig was on the left side of my spread and I was fishing one little hole and I caught some decent fish and then the bite just slowed down. That's typically going to be the case fishing for the whiting because they are going to kind of congregate in one area. So if you are fishing a spot and you kind of feel like you fished it out, definitely move down. I didn't even have to like literally pick up and move. I just moved my rod from the left and then I mm. put it in the middle, caught a few whiting there and then moved it to the right and caught a few whiting over there. So they, they kind of congregate. Um, together pretty tight so if you bounce around uh, definitely help increase the number of fish there for the whiting 
Dude, that's great advice. Yeah, that's a great Look, tip. I mean, is it me? Doesn't it seem like it's early in the year for whiting? I'm always like thinking like whiting to me has always been a, a wintertime fish. Yeah, and we we do get a really good whiting bite throughout the winter. That's kind of like the only thing you can really count on through the winter. The surface can be very difficult in the winter, but thankfully, specifically down Fort Morgan, uh, we do have a, a decent whiting bite year round. Yeah, I feel like the guys around the island have been saying that you know they're guaranteed whiting. If it feels like for a while, maybe even since you know fall, Tanner and all those guys have been kind of like, you know, my guaranteed whiting have not been guaranteed anymore. It is kind of it's been an odd year for them. I feel like. Yeah, yeah, and I can agree with that. Like, I was still running trips um, up until like June or July, um, and so so that was kind of your guarantee. Like, we can always at least go catch some whiting if we're down Fort Morgan. And, and early in the summer, we did kind of struggle with them. And if you were finding whiting, a lot of it was like little like eight to ten inches, not really anything worth keeping. But now it seems like we have started to get into some of the the bigger the bigger numbers and and uh, just larger fish. So it's definitely good to see that. Brad, what are you seeing as far as bait off the beach? Yeah, there's been a decent amount of like little glass minnows pushed up. Uh, we fished Orange Beach earlier this week, and there was a ton of little glass minnows right up on the beach. And there's been thousands of ladyfish just pushed in, chasing all this bait. And so if you want to get out and just catch something, um, go have fun if you're on vacation or you got a little kid that just wants to get in some action. Go out early morning and throw any sort of little diamond jig or a little spoon, and you're going to tear up the ladyfish. They have been thick. They're fun. When we went out, we're actually throwing throwing some big poppers trying to look for some bigger fish. There's actually been a lot of sharks hanging out around the beach. So we're throwing some big six-inch poppers. We're actually able to land a shark and a jack off the beach throwing the popper, which is a pretty cool experience. Yeah, no doubt. Those are big fish. I saw those on your Facebook page. Um, for those big poppers yeah, and those yeah, bigger target fish, what are you? Uh, what's your What's your favorite setup for those guys as far as rod, reel, and, and line? Yeah, so I had a. It was a six inch um, Yozuri popper, and then I ran probably eight to twelve inches of fifty pound wire, and then I ran about three foot eighty pound motto, just a little bit of a shock leader, a little shock leader, um, yeah. and then I use yeah. And I use 40 pound braid, and that is on a uh, pin slammer, the uh, 5500. And then I had that on a, a 10 foot bummy stick. Nice. And, and then to tackle bummy stick there. So uh, I like to use the 10 foot just to get a little extra distance going from the beach. You don't you don't necessarily have to have that, but a lot of times those bigger fish are going to be cruising the back side of the bar and stuff. So get that extra distance throwing a throwing a longer rod. What's the bite from a shark like on a popper? <laughs> it is insane so they if you've never experienced it like I, I think really you're just kind of pissing them off from the, the actual popper skipping across and making the splash and everything so i think they're just like turning on it and so they miss a bunch like i had multiple strikes and they miss but even when they miss it's like a huge swirl huge splash it's pretty crazy mm-hmm. and when they do actually get hooked up like they, they are angry so they they hit and it's been mostly black tips and spinners. So if you hit the spinner, he's going to be jumping, spinning like crazy, which is really cool to see. Most of the time, those are going to break you off. They're going to get tangled in your braid and cut your line and stuff. But those black tips, when they hit, and they just they start hauling, man, pill and drag. And it's always such a cool sound just to just hear that drag screaming. Really How cool big experience. are the sharks? The one that I caught was, I don't know, three and a half, four foot. So it was on the smaller end. Um, I think most of them have probably been in that four to five foot range after hanging out there. So Not, nothing giant, pounds. but good fun size. Yeah. Man, that's a big Man fish to pool. catch <laughs> off a beach with your feet in the sand. If you oh, think absolutely. About it. <laughs> absolutely. But it's not like it's not 10 foot sharks hanging out there that were catching on spinning gear. So right. good manageable cast out distance. So real fun. Cool. You seen any king mackerel or anything off the beach? I have not. Um, there has been some Spanish and some bluefish down towards Fort Morgan off the beach, but I've not seen any kings. That would be cool. I'd love to catch a king off the beach. Yep. I think it's about that time of year. If you could get a good north wind, if you could balloon a bait out mm-hmm. off the beach and try to whack a king off the beach, that would be pretty sweet. Man, it sounds like video content ideas to me. No doubt. <laughs> For sure. That would definitely be fun to watch. Something different. 
Yeah, very cool, man. I saw a video, I think it was yesterday, you posted in the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report group, all that grass. Uh, you think that's going to be an issue coming up for our peoples? Yes, it was It was pretty bad. Thankfully, I was not there um, set root fishing, but it was, it did seem manageable. So even, like I was throwing the popper, and so it didn't really interfere with me too much. Uh, there were a couple other guys down the beach that were set rig fishing and the grass was in, was kind of in some patches. And so it was super thick in some areas, but if you would walk down the beach, I don't know, 40, 50 yards, you, you'd get a little clear patch. And most of it was pushed in pretty tight. So if you're casting out um, a little further, you should be able to stay away from that. Now, this is really like, we had a ton of that sargasm early in the summer. Yeah. So this is really the first experience we've had with the June grass this year, which is Seems pretty late to me. It seems like it usually shows up a little early in the year. Um, so hopefully it doesn't stick around too long, but, but we'll see. Yeah, for sure, man. I hope not. Man, it was great to have you on the show, Brad. We appreciate you sharing your wisdom with our listeners. We definitely look forward to uh, hearing from you again, man. And if Pete, I think you said it in the beginning, but if people want to follow you on YouTube and your content creation and carry on with your fishing adventures, what's the best way for them to follow you? Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, it's Bearded Brad. I uh, post twice a week on YouTube. I, I pretty much post daily on Facebook. I'm posting on TikTok and Instagram as well. So any of those platforms, whatever you're on, you can find me, Bearded Brad. Very cool, man. We appreciate the report. We look forward to hearing from you next time, buddy. Be safe out there. All right. Appreciate y'all too, guys. All right, guys. It's always good to hear new uh, contributors on the show, given their tips and techniques. That was a great segment from Brad Warren, Bearded Brad. You guys take a quick break and check out a few of this week's sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Hilton's Real-Time Navigator. The days of heading out and blindly looking for good fishing areas are pretty much over. Don't waste time and money on fuel searching for fish. You need the most recent, highest resolution images to not only know where to go, but where not to go. The knowledge provided by today's technology is critical when planning an offshore fishing trip. Make the choice that professional captains all over the Gulf make and choose Hilton's Real-Time Navigator. The easy-to-use interface and excellent customer service will have you on the fish every time you go. Check them out at hiltonsoffshore.com. And also brought to you by Bucks Island. They have new pontoon boats, bass boats, bow riders, and aluminum boats for sale. They provide boat service on all kinds of boats, even if they weren't purchased from Bucks. Visit them at 4500 Highway 77 in Southside, Alabama, or give them a call at 256-442-2588. All right, Angelo, let's head on down and get our second report of the day. Marshall of Mississippi Sound. Let's see if he's staying true to his name. Welcome back to the show, Captain Bobby. What you been up to, bud? <laughs> oh, man, you guys have stuck me with that. I tell you, I can't believe how many people call me that now. I get heck, I, don't re- I, I get trip requests now, not by my name anymore. It's, hey, uh, can we uh, book something with the Marshall? <laughs> the Marshall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. That's well, me. Yeah. What you been up but to, man? Answer your question. Yeah, I have been. I have been. I've been uh, – Pretty much staying down, you know, certainly down south and mostly south uh, and west, which is the Mississippi Sound. For people that don't know or aren't aware of it, the spot, we only call it Mobile Bay, but when you get west of the Dolphin Island Bridge, uh, that's the Mississippi Sound, east of the Dolphin Island Bridge, and uh, north of the line between Fort Morgan and Dolphin Island is considered Mobile Bay. So, quick geography lesson right there. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so I've been down there, man, the last couple of days this week. Uh, I've had some just killer topwater trips, uh, certainly starting out in the morning. And, you know, late August is not what I consider topwater time of the year, but we've had that, that stretch of weather, you know, for the last five weeks that you guys I'm sure have talked about, uh, you know, with the rain and the storms and everything else that we've gotten every morning. And it's kept the water temperature down. And I think for that reason, uh, these fish have stayed active in shallow water, which allows you to do things like that with topwater and, and certainly voodoos on popping corks, which is a staple for me. Um, but, uh, what was really exciting, like I said, the last, and really this whole summer for that matter, I've caught more fish on top water for summertime fishing than I normally do. Uh, and, and again, I think it's kind of a product of a snowballing deal where, you know, the more I do it, the more I catch, therefore, the more I'm confident in it, therefore, the more I do it and so on and so forth, you know, so it all kind of builds on itself, but I still don't remember being able to catch fish, you know, early, I mean, this late into the summer, or early in the morning on top water, like we've been doing lately. And yes. We had all the fish well into the morning. We had the trip made by eight o'clock yesterday morning, just catching them on top water. So that was a blast. And we never picked up a cork until mid morning. And we could have probably caught them faster. You know, as you know, top water fishing is not like a real 
efficient way to catch fish. Right. You get a lot of bites for the number of fish that you actually get. And even when you do get in, get them in, you got all those treble hooks flopping around. So you don't just get them off the hook real quick and get, you know, do what you're going to do with them. You know, it takes a little while to get them unhooked and either put them in the box or let them go, you know? So uh, it's not a real efficient, fast numbers way to catch fish. Whereas if we just thrown yesterday, we had shrimp flipping around, birds diving. And, and when I start to see that stuff kind of going on in shallow water, we immediately are picking up corks with a voodoo or a gulp underneath it. And you really can run up some numbers that way. But we didn't do that because we we're catching so much, so, you know, catching them so well on top, which, you know, everybody loves to do. I don't care, you know, you know, how you fit fish. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter what, what species or, yeah I, yeah. Tell, yeah, I don't have to tell you guys that's a blast. So, Anyway, that's what I've been up to the last week or so, really all summer. And, you know, this week we're cycling out of the nip and going into this uh, tide where you got falling water right at daylight. And um, that, that to me, is the magic part of the tide because you got the two best components of a trout trip coming together at the same time, which is the tide change and the, and the daybreak, you know. So um, we got that to look forward to this weekend. So, you know, I think this weekend is going to be a fantastic weekend. You're just going to have to keep – you know, kind of one eye over your shoulder for the little pop-up storms. We're not having those squalls and nasty storms all morning like we were, you know, over the last five weeks. These are little pop-up showers that you can easily navigate around and stay away from, you know. So, um, that'd be a good weekend to get out there and, and uh, catch a fish or two if you're not going snapper fishing. Yep, for sure. I saw where they... And apparently they, a lot of people aren't going snapper fishing, so... <laughs> no, that's what the numbers do reflect. It, it, I was pretty surprised whenever I saw the the uh, variance in numbers from, you know, I guess they did it last weekend or the weekend before versus, you know, that time last year, it was pretty significant. It, it was, yeah. I think when there's not like this, like urgency, then yeah. people are like kind of doing whatever they want to do and they go do it on their leisure. Yeah. Cause you, cause like, you know, uh, Angel, like you, you know, it's like, yeah, well, I don't have to go this weekend because it looks like right now it's going to be open like last year, well into almost the holidays at the end of the year. So why not wait and go, you know, when you can and when it's convenient when the weather lets you you know which is about what i do so uh, me too and i think that's kind of that was kind of the whole idea from the very beginning of this thing is to pace it out and not put yourself into positions where you're going to get beat up or hurt or or you know worse yep yeah or worse yeah yeah that's right and then you know the other thing you too you throw in is the like the last couple years you know with probably a lot more activity out there and you're comparing this year's numbers you know and last year's numbers to those numbers where people were fishing all the time because they couldn't go to work or weren't going to work or going to school <laughs> right. or whatever you know and they were going out there and going fishing so there's and then you throw in the gas price fuel thing. prices so yeah. i think that yeah i think there's some of that going on too you know so um uh but it hadn't kept people off the water period i can tell there's still a lot of people fishing you know? yep. <laughs> whether it be inshore i mostly inshore but there's still a lot of people fishing you <laughs> check it out at the boat ramps you know and you know, again, even with the weather being the way it's been, um, the fishing still continues to be great. You just had to be careful over the last several weeks about, you know, when you went and where you went and that sort of thing. Yep. So speaking of you guys, you and Richard, the wrecking crew did pretty good in the saltwater fanatics tournament this weekend. Just kind of walk us through kind of what your strategy was, um, what you guys were throwing and, and what you found to be successful. Well, I'll tell you, first of all, I want to congratulate that group with saltwater fanatics for that tournament they put on. If you, uh, if you were out there and got to see it or got to see some of the uh, social media stuff they do, you really had to see it in person, how well that tournament was run, how organized it was, and that fishing chaos group that puts together the, the app and the scoring. It's unbelievable. It's up to the, I mean, up to the second updates on, you don't stand around and go like, I wonder what place I'm in. I wonder what this right. guy's weight was. It Boom, it pops up. And they had like a giant movie screen almost up there. And it showed immediately what the fish weights were and it kept it updated. So you were standing there, you know, remember the old days that somebody had, you had to wait till somebody got up there with a dry, dry erase and erased it <laughs> right. and, and put in, <laughs> you know, wrote it on a little piece of poster board. It ain't like that. That was these cats. And uh, man, the prizes were phenomenal. The turnout was great. Just an incredible, incredible job on the people's part. Marine resources, there was a bunch of fish turned in for tagging and, and uh, that sort of thing. And those people, mostly for the most part, I guess, are volunteers, you know, so uh, they spend a lot of time, you know, just not just the tournament day, days, but prior to the tournament organizing that thing. And to see what went into the organization of it really gives you an appreciation of how good of a job they did with that thing. It was just yeah, it was really, it was really incredible. I mean, just mind-boggling to see a local tournament run at a level that 
would rival a national tournament trail. You know what I'm saying? As far as the organization, because I've fished national trails before, and this is right there with us. I can tell you, or, or better than some of them, you know, so they did a wonderful job. Uh, as far as the fishing went, we got to, uh, we decided to, uh, do some croaker fishing, which I really don't get a chance to do as much as I like to. Um, we went and, um, caught some croakers, pulled the net and caught some croakers and, um, and we were free, mostly free lining croakers, uh, and with some current is how we caught our fish. And, um, that's, that's for some reason, trout get this hankering for croakers just during the hot months. You know, you, you just, for some reason, you can put that thing out during the winter, a croaker, and he'll die of old age before it's out eating, you know. <laughs> but, uh, man, for some reason during the summer, they get a hankering for them. And, man, you put those things out there, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, no cork on there. This was just free lining with either a little small weight on it or no weight in the current. And, um, you know that croaker's down there and, and that trout starts stalking them and you feel the croaker watch the rod tip start bouncing around and you know that's the key with croaker fishing if you're going to hold the rod tight line in it or stick it in the rod holders when that croaker gets starts to get real active like that that's when everybody wants to pick up the rod and start moving that rod tip around and that's the last thing you want to do because what's happened at that point is that trout or trout several trout have discovered that croaker and they have to position themselves to hit that croaker from the side and so they've got to move around a little bit well well a croaker knows that's going on <laughs> he just can't get away real well so he starts bouncing around so what's happened is a trout to locate him so if you pick up that rod and move that rod tip you're gonna you know that that rod it only looks like a little bit but you're probably moving a foot two th- three feet if you pick it up out of a rod holder well guess what that whole process has got to start all over again if you're lucky hmm. so what we do I like to do is I just stick it in the rod holder. Therefore, I'm not tempted to move the rod. I just let the croaker do the work. And the hooks I use are kale hooks, little suicide hooks, and they do a great job of hooking the the fish. There's nothing you have to do. It's like a almost like a circle hook, to where the fish really just hooks themselves. There's no hook setting per se. You know, you just let the rod bend over, pick it up, and the fish is on there. So it's a lot of fun. I love feeling the bite, but I I know when I feel that croaker start bouncing around. I quit talking. I do nothing but hold that rod real still and let that rod almost get pulled out of my hand before I start reeling. And then the, uh, the trout's on there, you know. So uh, it, it's a fun way to fish, you know. When you're doing a lot of cork fishing like we do on our charters, you have the visual aspect of the strike, seeing the cork go under. But this thing is more of a feel type of fishing, and it's a, uh, it's a neat way to catch them. And usually, you know, you catch small fish that way too, but typically what you're doing is catching some of the larger fish doing that. You you lose maybe a little bit on the numbers, but you uh, – you um you you know you tend to catch the, the higher quality fish and that's what we were needing to do is to catch fish in the 20 up to the 22 inch range which is about a three and a half to possibly four pound uh, trout and uh, so that's what we did for two days it was a lot of fun really really a lot different than than what we uh, normally do and you know in those things when you're limited by length whether it be redfish or trout or any species you know it just comes down to you know, if you can get lucky enough to get that trout to swallow the croaker that he bit when, he, right. when you hook him and it, or, or if he spits it out. That's the difference of whether or not you're going to win the tournament when you're limited by the length, you know, because I, I, I don't remember exactly the weights, but it seemed like between first and first and third was less than a half a pound on three fish. So you're talking about, you know, a few tenths of a pound per fish. So, <laughs> you know, they're basically all the same fish. It's just, what you know, whether one of them right. well, broke down his throat what they ate for that day that's exactly right yeah yeah that's exactly right if you if you ate a big pokey or a small croaker that's the that's the difference you know <laughs> yep kevin bobby when you're live lining these croakers are you like casting anything else like like are you just like sticking in the rod holder opening a bud light and that's a good that's a great question and that's another good thing about being able to tight line that croaker like i was just talking about where you're not you're not having to do anything. The rod's doing the work. So yes, to answer your question, usually if the bite's pretty hot, you know, in other words, if you're getting bit fairly quickly, you know, once every minute or two, I usually will just watch the rod. I'll stand by the rod. But if, if it's a little bit slower bite, if it gets a few minutes between bites, um, I'm always going to have a slip cork ready. Or in the case of what we were doing, we were able to, you know, we were fishing a cut, but we were able to cast on both, you know, cast from the boat to both sides of a point that had some fish on it so i'll pick up a top water or maybe even a popping cork depending on or if the current's run not running too too hard i'll I'll run a slip cork right along where i'm running the, the tight line and you could do all that because you don't have to have your hands on the tight line rod or the free line rod depending on how you you know it's the same thing it's just whether a tight line to me has got a weight free line doesn't so it's the same thing but 
Uh, yeah, so ask, that's a great question, and that's what frees you up to do that is using that type of hook and sticking that thing in the rod holder, knowing that you can't do anything that the rod holder can't do. I forgot what. Oh, I know. You know what it is? Captain Patrick. He's got this cool name. You know what he calls uh, stick, uh, putting a rod in the rod holder and letting the rod do the work? What's that? He said. Let, he, he says, "Let let Rodney do it." Rodney, That's right. The rod. <laughs> That's right. He, he hooks don't more fish than anybody I know. Yep. That's a fact. <laughs> So anyway, that's what, uh, so that's your question. Yeah. Rodney hooks a lot of fish. That's for sure. Uh, so yeah, I do that a lot and it's just a fact, you know, again, just get back to it. It's just kind of depends on how fast the bite is, you know, because I do want to get my hands on that rod when it bends over, you know, which involves getting down there and taking. So, so I kind of, usually I'll throw it out there, hold it for a second or two, then stick it in the rod holder, watch it for a second or two, maybe a minute. And then I might start thinking about, you know, drifting a slip cork or doing whatever else I can do while that's while Rodney's doing the work. You know, we're talking about tournaments now. The software is just dumb. crazy. It's, it's a game changer. Like, right. You know, I've run several tournaments and it's just instant, you know, good data in, good data out. I remember when we started the floor Bama, the guys from the deep sea fishing radio came over and helped us. And we were asking them about how do they tr- keep track of everything? You know, you've got 30 something categories and, couple hundred fish weighed in and they go well what we do is we have a box and then we've got 36 file folders for every fish and then we <laughs> stick it in that box i mean it was just and like it was less than 10 years ago is how like archaic that was and yeah you have somebody in you know till three in the morning auditing sorting everything. it all out yeah oh yeah, oh, yeah. no doubt it's uh that's and an then, interesting and then somebody change. got to put one of the weight tickets in the folder oh right? yeah yeah. Oh, I forgot. Yeah. I forgot about that seven pound trout that guy weighed in. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah there's not much room uh, for error in this. And I remember yeah. those, you know, I remember that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. You better believe it does. You, you guys have seen it. Have. Oh, but you know, when you start talking about billfish tournaments, blue water tournaments, like you're talking about and the kind the, the money that's involved, man, you better have your ducks in a row. I would, you know, certainly. And, uh, and, uh, again, I'm speaking for these, you know, for this one and, and the same way with the rodeo. Now it's come a long way since I started fishing those things. That thing, 40 years ago or whenever I fished my first one, it's come a long way from what it is, you know, to where they're at now. You know, you go in there now and they, they give you a ticket that's carbon copied, you know, you're documenting your weight in and you can check on those same thing. You know, it's got almost up to the leaderboards kept up to date. You can check it on your phone. Uh, They check your tickets on the phone, which is amazing uh, to me being technically incompetent. Like I am, you know how that (laughs) all works, but it's pretty cool, man. Yeah, anyway, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. Again, you know, congratulations to everybody that won and congratulations to people that put on the tournament. They they worked their tails off and put on a heck of a show. Yep, they do. Justin co hosted with me last week and kind of gave me the rundown and uh we had a good time and he put on a class A event. So definitely congratulations to him and I'm sure it'll be another one next year. They've been doing really great with it. Hopefully that redfish series will stick 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 with it here in Mobile. Yep, I would love to see. We've all, we've just been begging for a pro redfish event to get come back, you know, in whether it be Orange Beach or Mobile or somewhere nearby. I, I'd right. love to do that again. Yeah, for sure. So a couple questions I had after your report. Um, you're talking about Rodney doing the work. I know you're a rod head. <laughs> rod have nerd, a, yeah. That's right. Do you have a specific, because uh, I would assume you need, you know, a, a lot of touch, like you're saying, to watch that worm wiggle, but then you probably need a little bit of beef, too, to set the hook into that, uh, into that yep. fish. What? What's your ideal setup there, or does it matter? Do you have a, well, have, I, have a favorite? I do, I, I do, and actually, what I like for a, you know for that is very similar to my top water rods. I like a soft tip because I want that when that cro- I mean when that trout picks up that croaker, I don't I want that rod to have a little bit of give to it, you know, where it starts to bend over. But when it gets time to fight, particularly a bigger fish, which is what you're typically going to catch with a croaker or any kind of fin fish, I want to have some backbone in the rod so I can get that fish coming. So. The, and the rod I use for my slick lures and my topwater lures is very similar action to that. It's just a fast tip with a medium heavy body, you know, so it's got that softer tip. I'm not wor- too, too worried about feeling a real subtle bite, you know, same way with the topwaters and the slicks and the croakers. You know, most of those lures, that fish is getting that thing uh, and there's not a whole lot you have to do to actually feel the bite, you know, so... So that's the rig that I use. And I, you know, spinning or casting, either one works fine. Um, I've gotten where I, I, you know, umpteen, you know, forever, just use monofilament in that application, which is great for that. Once you get that fish on, that mono has the stretch. But I lean more towards fluorocarbon now just for the simple fact, one, it's a lot stronger. 
it doesn't have the stretch that mono has, but it's got more stretch than braid. So my tight line, my croaker rod now has a uh, fluorocarbon line on it and that rod action that I was just talking to you about. And then the hook size I use, I'm almost exclusively a number four kale hook, circle hooks that we use, you know, for snapper fish, not quite the same thing, but it's a little bronze, it's got a little offset to it and it's a little bronze. It's a number four kale hook. I've had so many people, not only the treble hooks that I use, which are small, but see those kale hooks and they go, God, that's a small one. I've caught tarpon while trout fishing on those things. I've caught cavalia, bull reds wow. by the dozens. You're not going to have any problems with that hook straightening out, but what it does, it hides real well because it's smaller and um, it get, lets the croaker move around a lot better than a big old, like a big old two aught hook or whatever. Um, it, it lets that croaker you know, free himself, it frees him up to move around and look a lot more natural. The other thing too about croaker fishing I'll mention is um, talking about moving around is if I put a croaker out there and he's out there for, sometimes I give it 10 minutes, but that's kind of a long time. I want to see that croaker at least moving a little bit at some point, you know, and once he's been out there for about 10 minutes, I usually will take him off and put another one on, you know, if he hasn't, even if he hasn't been bit, um, I go ahead and put another one on there because he's sitting there kind of fighting the current and still fighting a little bit of that weight. Mm -hmm. And I want that croaker, you know, what the guys call frisky. I want a frisky croaker on there because I think that's going to bring some trout, maybe even stimulate a bite, but maybe even bring trout in from a little bit further away. If you've got one bouncing around all by himself down there in that, that cut or over those rocks or whatever you're fishing him over. Oh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. So the CCA Star Tournament is still going on in Alabama. I think it's open until, well, I know it is. I'm looking at it right here. Ends on September 5th at 5 p.m. So there's been two caught. So you guys can still register. If there's not a blue tag caught that was registered, neither of those uh, were winners because they did not have a ticket. That's right. I was going to say, of the way I understand it, two of those were caught and the guys didn't have tickets, man. That's oh, right. Man. So if you have a ticket, yep. and if you have a ticket in after, after September Fifth, if a blue tagged redfish is not caught, it goes to a straight up raffle style. So the boat's going regardless. So might as well oh, go ahead and get man. a ticket. I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah. You got, yeah so you buy a oh, ticket, you got a one in uh, seventy five dollars ticket. Yeah, yeah. No, no, oh, it's a great, and not to mention the fact it goes. To, not to mention the fact it goes to a great cause on top. Exactly. Of that. So, exactly. You know, yeah. So wow, uh, that's great. Yeah, that's good odds. So you guys get registered for that. Go over to ccaalabama.org, I believe it is. And uh, tell us about Redfish, man. You've been catching any? What's been going on with those guys? I have been. Yeah, I have been. We, we caught, uh, if I remember right, we caught several in this tournament. One of them we caught targeting red to get our slam. Uh, we finished third in the slam, I think, uh, two or second. I can't remember. But anyway, uh, we caught our slam and uh, caught our targeted a redfish to do that. And then we caught several others while we were tight lining those croakers. But in the meantime, I've been catching you know, nice uh, slot size, lower to upper slot size fish mixed in with a lot of trout that I've been catching some of the shallow water I was talking about. You know, again, staying up there. Redfish don't care. They don't care if it's hot, cold, or anywhere in between. They'll, right. They're going to be wherever there's food, particularly if there's grass or shell around, you know. And so that's another thing that's fun about uh, catching trout up in the shallower waters that I like because you got a good chance of catching the slot red and flounder mixed in with that, you know, and there's been a lot of flounder caught, even by me, believe it or not a lot of flounder, but <laughs> any flounder for me is a lot of flounder. So <laughs> I actually even, I think I kept up with Rutland this weekend and we had to target flounder as well. And I think I kept up with him, which is amazing All right. when it comes to catching flounder, you know? So, uh, uh, yeah, I think I, he got a kick out of it because I caught our first flounder of the tournament when we went to target flounder, you know, so I don't know if I quite kept up with him, but I wasn't far back. I wasn't as far back as I usually am, which tells you that the flounder fishing is getting a lot better. <laughs> they think, uh, that's right. If I'm catching them, if I'm catching them, it's getting better. I'll tell you, my dad in the past week has caught 20 of them off his dock. He was wow. like, he's, he's like, I've never yeah. seen them so thick. That's great. You know, and, and, uh, and that's, you know, it's, it, the area in the well really the bay we caught ours around docks too but that that kind of area is something about the environment of that that you know whether it's an active dock or broken down they just seem to love those dock pilings or those kind of things because uh where we were catching ours the ones we targeted to catch we were just flipping right up in dock plot in you know, both active docks and, and broken down dock pilings is where we caught ours you know and um they just seem to love love that area whether it's a good ambush and they're ambush feeders so it makes sense that they would be around that kind of stuff, you know, there's always bait hanging around it. So, uh, but it's just so good to hear that so many flounder are being caught now, you know, because what, for the last eight years or well, eight years prior to this, 
you know, it was been tough. <laughs> it was yeah, slim pickings when it came to floundering. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah Rich and I were see. talking about. It. As a matter of fact, we joked about it. We caught our when we caught our flounder, our first flounder, which gave us our slam. You know, when they first used to do those slam tournaments. You know, when we and this was about a I don't even know how big. It wasn't a very big flounder, about a sixteen inch flounder that I caught. And I said, Do you remember? You know, not long ago, eight, six, eight years ago, or ten years ago, when we were fishing these things. If we caught that flounder, we'd be hugging each other and dancing and doing yeah. square dances on a boat. Had it wrapped we up. Our flounder. Now we're going like, this ain't going to do. We got to catch a three or four pound flounder. You know, we used to never worry about the size. It's just a matter of catching one. You know, yeah. but it ain't like that now. They're they're getting where they're they're uh, you know it's a common occurrence to catch flounders. Yep, a bunch of them. That's great to see, man. For sure, a lot of good reasons. Uh, it is that's happening. It shows so. conservation work, man. Yep. Shows our marine resources people know what they're doing too. Yep, agreed. And talk about the fanatics thing. I think they brought in over a hundred of the brood stock flounder. I think I'm not sure if all those were males, so <laughs> yeah. I guess that's not fair. But I think they had over a hundred live turned in. It was a bunch of them. I know that. And then one of the guys, the guy that won it, I think they ended up bringing 39 flounder in. You know, so uh, that's he crazy. Had the man. most flounder. You know, that's that's incredible. You know, in a two day period, Heck that's more yeah. than I catch in two years. <laughs> no doubt. Me too. Apparently. <laughs> Oh, man, that's a great report. Uh, we appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom with our listeners, as always. If folks want to book a trip with you, what's the best way to get in contact with you? By far, the easiest way is A-Team Fishing, like the old Mr. T show, A-Team Fishing, all one word, dot com. And it's got our contact information in the form of a telephone number and a little form on there you fill out if you want to request dates or have us pick dates for you we can do that but it's uh it's so easy that i can even do it so you can get around <laughs> on it pretty easy we appreciate it man you guys get in touch with captain bobby right. you know, i'm sure your fall stuff's filling up man it's, it's about to be a good time i'm ready for fall man i'm excited this year for sure it, it is dude it ain't far away and don't forget licenses are due speaking of that too that's right so, uh, that is right oh yeah yep Time to re-up. Yep. License is due. Time to re-up. Yep. Pay for some of that conservation effort. That's what That's it is. That's right. That's right. We appreciate the reminder on that, man. We look forward to hearing from you next time, buddy. Be safe out there. Thank you, my brother. Thanks for having me on. Man, it's always good to hear from the old Marshall, the Mississippi Sound. That was a great inshore report from Captain Bobby Abrascado with 18 Fishing Adventures. You guys take a quick minute and check out a few of this week's great sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Fish Bites. Since 1999, Car Specialty Baits, Inc. has been busy revolutionizing the fishing industry with their game-changing brand of baits and lures called Fish Bites. Check out the full line of scented saltwater and freshwater baits at fishbites.com. And also brought to you by MB Ranch King. MB Ranch King hunting blinds and feeders are built to last right here in the USA. With durability and convenience in mind, MB Ranch King's maintenance-free blinds are constructed with high-grade steel and come in a variety of sizes to meet any hunter's needs. They offer high-quality, easy-to-use corn and protein feeders that can be filled with both feet on the ground. Call Kevin today for more info or a quote at 205-807-2937. MB Ranch King, built in the pursuit of perfection. All right, Angelo, let's head offshore, man. Let's go see what Captain King is up to on the Lady Ann out of Dolphin Island, Alabama. What you say, Captain King? Oh, man, all good, Butch. Good, man. Good. Glad to have you back on the show. I know you guys have been doing a, a ton of fishing. Um, I saw where you guys have been offshore multiple times on two- and three-day trips in the last couple weeks. Just give us the rundown, man. What you guys seeing out there? Man, we've pretty much been living out there the past couple of weeks. The, the past couple of weeks has been, it's been spotty. I'd say not this week, but the week before last. It's been pretty much non-existent. The tuna fishing, we've I've been everywhere in the world, and we hadn't seen a yellowfin. We hadn't caught a yellowfin. The blackfin fishing at night was bad. It was just just not good fishing. Bang. But this week, it's really turned around, man. Everywhere that I've been, I've been seeing a few fish. We've been catching a few fish. We're catching a few marlin, a few tuna. Just just the fishing, it, it's crazy. I don't know if it was the moon phase. I don't, if, if, I don't know what went into it. But the vision has just been a lot better this week than what it has been. Hmm. So. I mean, blue water is still like non-existent, right? S stupid far out. Uh, yeah. I mean, probably a hundred, a hundred and fifty miles somewhere in there. Which, yeah, it's a long way to get out there That's too. A long but way. the blue water has not been the key. I mean, we've been catching more fish in the greenish waters. I mean, it's not blue and it's not dirty, but it's kind of just it's it's okay water. That's right. where the fish have been hanging out. I went from the green water to the blue water, never marked a fish in the blue water, never saw a fish, went back up into the green water, and we started catching them. And it, mm. I don't know if there's more nutrients in it or what the case was, but they they just, a lot of guys go there and they, they always ask me, like, King, where's the blue water at? Like, man, like, 
that's not really important. Like where are the fish at is the important question. Yep, and right. uh, they, they've been living in the greener water. They just have been. I like that, that clear tuna water. I, th- I I prefer that if I'm strictly going for tuna anyways, I think you're right about the nutrients. I just think it's got, uh, especially when I guess blue water is so far away from it, it seems like it's just got more life in it. Yeah. And there's no doubt. And I feel like in that dirtier water, you can get away with more stuff. You can use for bigger sure. hooks and bigger ones. And you, the, the fish just don't see as well in that water. They can see your bait, but they can't see, you know, what's between the bait and the tip of that rod. Well, what, what kind of bait are you catching? What are you catching your bait at? Oh, uh, man, we've been catching, the bait fishing has been really good. We've been catching a bunch of little hardtails, a bunch of sardines, big hardtails, crazy fish. Uh, really, everywhere I've been, man, all the way from the rigs and close to the ships, you know, 10 miles out, they've all been loaded with bait. It's just, it's just, it's getting to be that time of, you know, in the springtime and kind of the middle of the summer, we struggle with catching bait. It's kind of hit and miss. But this time of year, it's just, it's been everywhere. And I've, I've been happy about that. Yeah, that definitely makes a difference. On our trip, Angelo, it seemed like, you know, I, I, I like a littler hardtail, but for different things and not scamp. But it seemed like on our trip, on the escapes, those those yeah. scamp, all those, all those big scamp came from those six inch hardtails, it seemed like. Yeah, yeah. And I had a trip of, what was it? A couple weeks ago, we had a 12-hour trip. We were going group on fishing. That was, I had to set my mind, so we were going to try to catch some scamps. And we struggled for the bait, man. We caught nothing but little four-inch hardtails, maybe three-inch hardtails. They weren't big at all. And I'm riding up there to the group of grounds. So I'm like, oh, my God. Now, I'm stressed out. I'm like, we're coming out here with bait. That it's, just, it's not the ideal bait. But we wore them out. And we caught, I think it was 19 or 20, something like 19 or 20 groupers. And they all came off of them little tiny hardtails. And that, mm. that, that struck me as, okay, like this may be the ticket. You know, this is, I've tried all kinds of bait. And I always like the crazy fish or the bigger mm. fish or whatever the case may be. But them little hardtails just tore them up. It was, it was good. King, uh, with the tunas, what are you doing? Live bait and chunking? You having to fly a kite? What's catching the fish? Or a little bit of everything. Man, all of the above, all of the above. I've trolled for them. I, I throw live, put live baits in the riggers and drift around with them. I chunk for them. I fly a kite for them. What, for me, lately, what's been working, and every day that you out there is different. It's, it's a totally different animal. Even when you wake up the next morning and start fishing for them again, it's, it's different. But I've been, you know, stuffing a bunch of baits in my bat, throwing 15, 20 baits out there at a time, and throwing my live baits right in the middle of the, of the, of the bat. And they they come up and they blow up and they you know they they I can bring them up from 300 foot, and that's what we've been really doing good what well with is the live bait chumming you know which I don't know if it's a, a lot of people know about that but it's kind of the newer thing that's been going on out there. Yeah, I know and that Dustin that Dustin Bedgood bait. likes it that way. Yeah, you got to have a lot of baits. I know Bedgood likes doing that too. Oh yeah, man, I love doing that too. It's just the problem that I, if, even if I got 500 baits. I got to save some for the next day. So I, we go to chum in 30 at a time, 40 at a time. I'm looking at the live boat. I'm like, okay, like we need to, <laughs> we need to have some to be fishing the next morning, y'all. And so it comes to a point to where we catch a couple of fish on it. It's always just a couple, you know, two or three fish like that. And we got to stop doing that because we have to save our bait for the scamps. But, for sure. What size hook do you like on that? You going real small or just kind of sticking around that medium range? Tiny hooks. You got to have a tiny hook. I'd say hook probably about as big as your thumb. Because the, uh, these fish are just smart, man. They got big eyes. They they've been seeing these baits all the time. They, they see a lot smart, of baits. It, mm-hmm. They're smart fish, and I've had them blow it behind the boat. I've had I've seen thirty fish come behind the boat, and they won't touch the one that's got the hook in it. <laughs> and so when that happens, I'm like, okay, man, we got to do something different. You know, when you're on a good spot like that, you've got to capitalize. And so I've even I put a I put a bait up in the kite and set it twenty foot behind the boat and started chumming the heck out of some baits. And they start blowing up and blowing up, and they can't see your leader when it's on the kite. And so they come and they eat that bait. And you, once you get one on, you got to keep them going. You got to put another bait out. And hopefully you can hook three or four or five at one time. And yeah. that way, because they're going to bite for a little bit and then they're going to stop. So you have to take advantage of the fish while they're biting. I like that idea of live baiting from the kite with doing that live bait chumming. I like the idea of yeah. just going fishing with King and having his crew do all that work. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. That's definitely <laughs> the way to go. <laughs> I mean, all I hear is work. Oh yeah, and it's definitely the cheapest way to go too. Oh no, no doubt. doubt, without a doubt. Yep, it's definitely a grind, man. Like whenever you're talking about, whenever it gets to to where it's like that, where you got to catch one with one method and then change over and get another one. That is a grind for sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I I would love to have a day where you can just catch them all trolling, or but they 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 just they're just not like that. You you have to work them out. The only way to tune fish correctly is to work your butt off. You know, yep. try this, try that, move here, move there, and if you work hard enough, you're gonna pick one here, you're gonna pick one there, you're gonna get two here, and then if it's by the end of the trip, you're gonna have ten or fifteen nice nice fish. You know, yep. and that's the way. And I. I've been doing this for a little while, and that's the way it's always been, in my opinion. You know, you're gonna have them days where you got there, and you just don't matter what you do, you're gonna catch them. But what makes a good fisherman is the guys that catch them when they're not biting good. You know. Yeah, that's a fact. Because it's a grind. You got to stay after it. It's a 3 a.m. chunking. It's a 5 a.m. chunking, and then trolling at daylight, and then put the kite up. You know, whenever that ends, it's it's a grind. Yeah. It's, what about uh, the white marlin, man? Tell us about that one. What'd you catch him on, and uh, what was I, the ticket there? So, we actually what I came back two days ago from a three-dayer maybe a day, yeah, day, two yeah. day went, and uh man the fishing was just good we caught we hooked three marlin on that trip and then wow. the white marlin we actually caught him but it, he came we were trolling for tuna we we're getting good bites catching tuna catching tuna black fan you know a few yellow fans some undersized supposed to go with it and all of a sudden i saw that white marlin behind that bed. i looked down and all you could see was fin and tail That's i was awesome. like i saw i didn't even tell the guys because i didn't want him to get too excited i, was like, <laughs> I looked at him, i saw him with tail let's just wait for him to bite we're gonna i don't want to tell anybody he's like let's just capitalize on the fish after he's hooked and sure enough man he he pecked at it with his with his uh with his bill and then he just swallowed the whole entire lure and got on and he it was cool fish man we fought him for like 30 minutes or so and the guy that caught him he was his first marlin ever so he, he was totally pumped about it that's awesome he came up we we uh got a good picture of him and released him and, and it was man it was just cool that's a very uh that's a perfect size for a first marlin for anybody <laughs> or really just in general that's perfect size to catch a marlin yeah it's funny you say that but it's because everybody wants to get a big marlin i, I love catching them too but we hooked a big blue after that and the guy was sitting there holding the reel he was he was just dumping us man he was taking every bit of line out of the reel and the guy looked at my uh, my deckhand uh jake at the time he said man he said i don't know that i want this <laughs> 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 i was like i just thought i said man keep on reeling yeah oh, yeah that's and funny. he was i think he was more wanting one of the white marlins than he was the blue yep it, it definitely was manageable sizes uh not all i mean of course catching big blues is that's what we do but it's the time and a place for that as you guys found out on rodeo it's uh you're gonna have that when you got them big girls on it's interesting yeah they no doubt you're gonna have some of that maybe nobody wants to sit there and fight one for six seven hours Ooh, but... not this guy angelo might but not this guy i like a good tussle i like a good tussle <laughs> yeah man captain king that's a great report man we look forward to uh hearing from you next time if folks want to get out of off island with you and get a trip what's the best way to get in contact with you a uh, man they can they can call that phone number 861-5302 or they can look us up online catmichaelmine.com and uh, they can see my whole schedule from there and book straight from the website awesome buddy like i said we appreciate you sharing your wisdom with our listeners and uh man just be safe out there we look forward to hearing from you next time will do but i appreciate y'all having me man all right, guys, it's always good to hear from Captain King Marshand from the Lady Ann over there, Dolphin Island, Alabama, with Captain Mike's Deep Sea Fishing. You guys take a quick break and check out a few of this week's great sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Boaters List. Boaters List is your new, reliable, and fast resource designed to link everyone to everything on the water. If you own or run a boat, you know how difficult it can be to find the right company for the task at hand. Boaters List makes it easy to find the service that you are looking for. Locate anything from fuel docks to service repairs or rentals of large yachts, even down to paddle boards and all things in between. BoatersList.com will always strive to make it better on the water. And also brought to you by Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks are proud to be your metal roofing headquarters for over 40 years. Save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the Gulf Coast. Buy it today, pick it up today. They offer 20 Sherwin-Williams colors to choose from and have a 40-year warranty. Baker Metal and Dixie Supply, two names, same great service. With the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks, your metal roofing headquarters. All right, Angelo, you know, we got to do what did you learn before we get up out of here today, man? What'd you take away from today's show? Do you have any pearls of wisdom you took away? I mean, number four, kale hook, but, but I never write anything down, but like <laughs> I'm trying to like inshore fish a little bit more and like the kale hook is being reintroduced to me. Like I used to do a ton of fish, inshore fishing as a kid. And like, I was like, all right, number four kale hook, that's got to go into my tackle box. Yep. And like in my head, I'm like, man, number kale hooks, I'm going to use that more often for just everything from inshore fishing for trout to trying to catch blue marlin or whatnot, because it's like a, 
circle hook for dummies that's a hybrid yeah i know captain richard and captain patrick use them i know captain patrick likes them for um you know like that slip cork and stuff down deep he does at 10 or 15 feet down and he has great success with speckled trout and he also likes them for sheep's head a lot too i'm pretty sure we're using them a couple weeks ago for a triple tail i mean mm. yeah i think he likes them for those you miss a single fish you just reeled into them and you yeah. caught them I'm pretty sure that's what uh, Captain Blood uses for his triple tail setups as well, even like for freelance uh, shrimp and stuff. Oh, I believe it. I believe yep. it. Yep. What about you, man? What what was your takeaway from the day? What did you learn? Uh, I also had the kale hook written down. I like the croaker. Uh, I like the live live croaker freeline and talk. I think definitely what I picked up from this week is I've, I personally, well, I guess I've done a little bit of it. Um, the live bait chumming like Captain King was talking about. Man, you just have to have – a huge amount of bait for that got to have a big live well so not every boat can really even have that option i've done a little bit of that but i've also done a lot of kite fishing but i've never done the two simultaneously so that definitely makes sense especially if they're super leader shy or, or acting that way throw out a bunch get your kite up you know get your bait ready throw out a bunch right under that kite and uh i mean that's a that's a win that's a winner right there that's a great tip what I took away from that was like, you better have a skilled crew, right? Oh, you know, yeah. you can have some guys that can bait fish, some guys that can fly a kite, you know, some guys that can hook some fish, some guys throwing out the bait. I mean, that's a team. An operation. That's a team. Yep. All right, guys, that wraps up another great segment. Let's take a quick break and check out a few more of this week's great sponsors. That segment was brought to you by Test Calibration. Is your diesel engine showing signs of low pressure or excessive engine smoke? If so, you may be in need of a repair to your diesel fuel injection system. Test Calibration has been selling and servicing diesel turbochargers and fuel injection systems since 1976 and are up to date with all the latest diesel technology. No matter if you're running a diesel in your boat, tractor, or truck, Test Calibration can help you. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. And also brought to you by National Land Realty. If you're in the market to sell your land, check out the fastest growing, most innovative land brokerage in the country. With the largest online presence in the industry, the bottom line is when you market your land through National Land Realty, the right buyers will know your land is for sale. Contact your Emerald Coast National Land agent. That's me, Joe Baia at jbaia at nationalland.com or call me at 850-296-7098. All right, Angelo, that wraps up another great Alabama saltwater fishing report, man. I appreciate you co-hosting with me today. It was a good time. A lot of good information. Dude, always enjoy doing it. Always feel like I learned something. I mean, it's just amazing that, like, the information you get from from listening to this show. And uh, looking forward to the next one. Absolutely, man. We appreciate it. Thanks for that real estate update at the very beginning. If folks want to get up with you and pick your brain on any of that kind of stuff, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Man, quite honestly, you can Google me. Uh, you know, if you put out a Coastal Connection in real estate, you'll find me or just thecoastalconnection.com. That's the website. All our contacts there. You can search property from Dolphin Island, Alabama, all the way to Appalachicola. Uh, you can chat with us through it. You can send us an email. Just give me a call. I like phone calls. So. Yep. Always good to talk to somebody in person. Man, we appreciate it. And it was fun, man. I enjoyed it. We look forward to it next time. I do. Catch you later. All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up this week. You guys, please make sure and subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to text the word fishing to 314-665-1767 to get that free AFCO sun protection mask promo code and also to be added to our email list. And we'll send you the new show each week. You guys keep whacking them. Be safe out there. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by Sam Stop and Shop. Sam Stop and Shop is your one-stop shop located at 27122 Canal Road in Orange Beach. Sam's has a little bit of everything, including a deli, inshore, offshore, and surf fishing tackle. They also have bait, clothing, groceries, name brand sunglasses, and so much more. Stop by and shop or call them at 251-981-4245 today. And also, Richardoni Family Dentistry. You're going to need a good dentist, so you may as well make an appointment with fellow angler Josh Richardoni. Call today to book an appointment at 251-342-6672. Also brought to you by Foster Contracting Fortified Roofing Pros. Did you know you could save up to 40% on your homeowner's insurance with a fortified roof? Learn more at fortifiedroofingpros.com or call them at 251-973-9999. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report brought to you by me, Angelo DiPaola, The Coastal Connection. Find us online at thecoastalconnection.com. 
and also brought to you by LM Marine. LM Marine has something for everyone from small hunting boats, pontoons, as well as bigger bay hybrid boats for the hardcore angler. Go visit them at 34600 Highway 59 in Stapleton, Alabama, or call 251 937 1380. And also brought to you by the Alabama Marine Resources Division. The Alabama Marine Resources Division reminds all recreational anglers that gray trigger fish, greater amber jack, or red snapper must be reported through Snapper Check prior to landing the fish in Alabama. For more information about Snapper Check, please visit OutdoorAlabama.com. And also brought to you by United Bank. United Bank supports our farmers with financial products and services designed specifically for agribusiness. All loans subject to credit approval, equity housing opportunity lender, member FDIC. And also brought to you by Admiral Shellfish. Admiral oysters are available by the dozen at Bon Secure Fisheries, Inc. in Bon Secure, Alabama. From a simple, nutrient-dense appetizer at home or a shucking party with friends, Admiral Oysters will steal the show. Call 251-949-7411 for pricing and availability. Follow their adventures on Instagram at Admiral Shellfish Co. And also, Photonist Defense, simply the best-in-class night vision systems ever built. Contact them at photonistdefense.com to learn more. Photonist Defense, Masters of Darkness. And also, Aftco, family-owned and operated Aftco Fishing Apparel and Tackle are designed to handle the harshest elements that help you weather any day on the water. From cold tournament mornings to the humid summers of Florida, visit aftco.com, that's A-F-T-C-O.com for on-the-water performance gear. 